right on over to the final presentation of the day on river boats that, uh, and ferry boats that were, uh, shall we say, not common uh, to the Mississippi River, although we're going to talk a little bit about the Mississippi too. And just real quick, uh, can everybody see my PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay, great. So we've covered the Mississippi really well already. And this also, it, this is a presentation that some folks may already have some familiarity with um, because this, this presentation, this, this day attracted folks who were interested in inland waterways as well as railroads. But uh, we're gonna look at a, a more holistic and broader overview of other rail marine operations in the United States. Um, this one is not going to entirely focus on inland waterways. We are going to talk about two of the most significant U.S.-based uh, uh, open water uh, freight uh, rail and passenger rail transfer operations uh, before, we, uh, before we get kicked out of here. So um, in the 1830s, uh, we have the railroad industry starting up. You've got the United States essentially uh, it doesn't stretch entirely from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It does go to the Pacific Northwest. We've got plenty of rivers and mountains to cross. And the initial railroads are uh, very regional in nature. Uh, Baltimore and Ohio, uh, Mohawk and Hudson River, uh, uh, the uh, New York, New Haven, and Hartford. These are railroads that have a very limited geographic focus. Uh, in many cases, they are linking components of the, uh, uh, what I want to say, the, the uh, existing inland waterways network. And uh, they are, they're cooperative. They're not necessarily competing at the moment with the existing inland waterways. So, uh, the idea of having to cross a, a river isn't something that necessarily is, is there something the railroads are worrying about right now. Uh, it does start to appear shockingly on the East Coast, uh, where you do have occasionally the inconveniently placed river for Western commerce, uh, such as the Hudson or the Susquehanna, uh, that you're going to have to deal with. And in some places, um, those rivers are significant uh, enough in width that uh, bridging them at the time is more expensive uh, or would take too much time for these railroad companies to invest in. So the ferry boat becomes a convenient stopgap. Uh, also, conveniently uh, for the companies, the, the marine application of steam power shows up to help make this uh, a feasible project. And we get our first uh, railroad ferry in 1836. This is not actually the original ferry boat, uh, but this is the, uh, the site. Uh, this is the, uh, the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore's ferry operation on the Susquehanna River at the very, almost near the mouth of the river, almost at the mouth of the river in Maryland, uh, connecting the towns of Havre de Grace, Maryland, and Perryville. Uh, it was uh, a steam ferry. It uh, was in existence until after the Civil War as an operating ferry operation. It does play an important uh, historical footnote in the early days of the Civil War uh, in that it, uh, the seizure of the ferry boat allowed uh, troops to bypass the city of Baltimore from the north and get into Washington, D.C. The railroad bridges uh, north of Baltimore had been burned. So this ferry boat uh, was pressed into service uh, to move troops. And actually that's what um, Nast, Thomas Nast is sketching in this uh, uh, Harper's uh, image. And you can see there's the railroad cars and there's the ferry boat and there's the landing. The actual landing site is still visible in town today. It's, it's a depressed street that goes down to the riverfront. But uh, after the war, they, they start bridging 
And that's pretty much the end of it. But it is a success. It, it allows the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad to do exactly what it needs to do. And it allows this regional railroad to carry out its mission. Now, in the following two decades, the 1840s, the 1850s, these regional railroads start to look over the horizon and the network starts to expand. Uh, in most cases, uh, the first river that railroad executives and engineers are going to start looking at uh, uh, how to deal with is the Ohio. Uh, most of the railroad construction is in the north and the mid-Atlantic. There is some construction in the south, but that's not quite at the pace, uh, the feverish pace that the northern and mid-Atlantic railroad lines are seeing. And again, the Ohio becomes a flashpoint of, of uh, engineering uh, trade-offs. It's too wide to bridge. It's too expensive to bridge. They do bridge the, the, the line, the river in, in 1852 at Wheeling with a very famous uh, Eads designed uh, bridge, which still stands to this day, or Ellet Bridge. Um, but for that's a that was a, a horse and pedestrian bridge. It was not a railroad bridge. The engineering that was required and the expense that was required was far in excess of what most railroad companies were willing to pay. And further, as the uh, Eads Bridge folks will tell you, and the Rock Island Bridge folks would tell you. Uh, the steamboat interests were a powerful adversary in preventing your bridge from getting uh, approval for construction. So the ferry boat becomes a convenient stopgap. This is a, an inset uh, from an article in the b &O Historical Society's magazine, The Sentinel, about one of the early ferry boat operations. This was an 1855 operation between the town of Benwood, uh, West Virginia, which at the time was Benwood, Virginia, just south of Wheeling and the town of Bel Air, Ohio. And uh, that was initially one of the earliest bridging operations of, of moving freight cars across uh, the Ohio River. Uh, one thing uh, to note about this situation, it was unique in that the, uh, the two railroads in question, the B&O and the Central, or the Ohio Central had slightly different gauge. So if you're gonna run cars between those two companies, they had to have uh, wheels that would work on both, uh, both sets of track. And uh, that became kind of a niche industry with railroad uh, freight car design is building uh, universal wheels rather than setting a standard for track gauge, which is the width between the rails, uh, they built cars that could run on various gauges. Uh, that's gonna be kind of an on and off thing until the 1870s when we finally standardized gauging. But uh, that was an initial uh, process here in Ohio. And the, the map showed a very primitive operation. This is a, a slightly later, but shows the primitive nature yeah, of this. And I have to apologize for the announcement here. Okay, so you guys got to miss the announcement that the library computer lab's closing in 15 minutes. So uh, this is in Parkersburg, West Virginia on the Little Kanawha River. Uh, it was running into the 20th century and it was a very primitive operation. And I use it because it's, it's some of the better photographic representations that show what an 1850s, uh, 19th century era car ferry operation would look like. Uh, Notice that the, uh, the locomotive, it's gonna get its wheels wet here. This is the, uh, the bridge you would use to get to your barge. And that's what the operation would look like. Uh, this, uh, there's a nice little article from a 2006 issue of the Sentinel about this whole operation, but it's an excellent photographic record to help kind of show you what this initial early 19th century primitive ferry boat operation was. And, one reason why the moment that most of these railroad companies could build a bridge, they did so. Uh, this was just an operational headache, and I'm sure that the engine crews were not real happy to see some of the, uh, you know, are we supposed to be sinking like this? Did they load the cars right? Uh, 
it's somewhat disconcerting. Now, I do have to mention the anti-train ferry, or if you're a Superman fan, the Bizarro train ferry. Uh, we did have, uh, uh, in the 19th century, a great uh, portage railroad operation in Pennsylvania that became part of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and you can still visit it today at the Allegheny Portage National Historic Site, but uh, this operation from 1834 to 1854 reversed the concept that we're talking about and put the boats on the railroad instead of the railroad on the boats. I felt I was honor bound to cover it because you know we had such a strong waterways involvement today. So uh, as the time went on in the in the 19th century, the ferry boat operations were pretty standard. We had you know operate ferry boats uh, operating here in St. Louis. We had them in Cincinnati. We had them in uh, Louisville. Uh, Pittsburgh, New York, uh, nothing, you know, the technology was pretty static. It's not until the Civil War that uh, the next idea of, of rail and water transportation starts to show up, and that's um, moving trains worth of freight a significant distance, either to get around uh, a bottleneck, an operational bottleneck, or to uh, get around the competition. And with the Civil War, you had both bottlenecks. And if you were the United States Army and Herman Hopped, the competition was the Confederate Army continually wrecking your railroad tracks and making the supply line vulnerable. Uh, if you could figure out a way to, to get around that, so much the better. And the soldiers who were looking for those uh, letters, food parcels, ammunition, medical supplies, they were happy too. And Haupt gets credit for developing one of what essentially became the first modern car float operation in the United States, where entire railroad cars were loaded, in this case, two canal barges that had been conscripted for this project with transverse tracks. Uh, and here's the, here's the pier that would match up with these tracks. And uh, these cars would be tied down to these canal boats that were made into a barge. Um, they had a sophisticated um, uh, car float bridge to allow for um, the uh, safe loading of the barge in such a way that you wouldn't flip the barge over, which was important because, you know, if you sink the barge while you're loading it, well, you've just ruined your day. And it, it worked. It, this uh, operation went down the Potomac River from Alexandria, which was the principal Union railhead in Virginia, to, um, in most cases, it went down to Aquia Creek, which is between Washington, D.C. and Fredericksburg uh, on the Potomac River. Uh, it's, it was the original endpoint of the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac. Uh, Bernard Kapinski, uh, who you may have seen at an earlier Barrier Seminar for his Civil War Railroad uh, layout. Uh, he did a model of this operation uh, for his for his layout uh, and scratch built it. And that's this is an excellent representation to help people understand how this worked. You know, the the bridge is going to float here with the barge, compensate, and allow for the safe loading and unloading of the barge uh, of the railroad cars on the barge. Uh, just a brilliant concept. And honestly, the technology is still in use to this day. Uh, the fundamental idea of, of a compensating bridge that uh, moves with the, with the weights uh, and moves with the barge uh, is elegantly simple, elegantly brilliant, mechanically simple to maintain, and it works. And there's never been any real need to improve that. With that, uh, you do see later an expansion of the concept uh, of railroad ferries and barge operations. The Union Pacific, which uh, starts its construction at Omaha, Nebraska, on the other side of the Missouri River from the railhead at Council Bluffs, does not have a bridge built and will not have a bridge built until after the transcontinental railroad itself is built. Uh, employs a ferry boat operation until the winter where the river uh, freezes over and then we'll lay track across the river to connect uh, Council Bluff in Omaha and then take the track up when the river thaws. Uh, this operation 
was essentially the main lifeline for the Missouri, for the Union Pacific as it constructed uh, its tracks west. Uh, it really won't be abandoned until the bridges are finished in, in the 1870s. Union Pacific doesn't get its own bridge at Omaha until 1872, but the Mississippi and Missouri bridge finishes earlier. And that's actually a Rock Island controlled bridge uh, by that time. Uh, and this becomes a theme uh, throughout the country. As, as the Civil War ends, you see these ferry boat operations start to literally dry up. We just talked about what happens in St. Louis. Yes, Wiggins in the short term thrived and survived after the Eads Bridge was built. Uh, but I mean, honestly, realistically, from a cost benefit standpoint and an operational elegance standpoint, the bridge is the better option. The bridge doesn't have to worry about uh, the uh, river freezing. The bridge doesn't have to worry about the river levels being too low. Occasionally, the bridge has to worry about river, level, river levels being too high, uh, as, as in fact, a few years ago, uh, the Eads Bridge saw that happen, where it took off a, a pilot house of a towboat during a flood. Uh, but when bridges get built, you start to see the ferry boat operations uh, retreat uh, in general. That's not to say it happens all at once. Um, you know, St. Genevieve, the Missouri and Indiana Railroad, uh, was a long standing and actually a late developing uh, rail ferry operation. It started in 1903 and ran until 1961 to connect. Uh, Illinois and Missouri, even after the Thebes Bridge was finished, it was still in operation. Uh, and in fact, if you ever want to read the, the justification for, for shutting it down, we have that in the John W. Berger the third paper. Basically, Mopac was like, a, really, it's not worth keeping this going anymore, despite what some of our shippers are saying. Uh, we're just going to use the bridge. Uh, the company itself, there's a Charlie Duckworth of the Mopac Historical Society has an excellent history of the m &I that touches on all of this. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, reading it if you really wanna dive into it. But essentially there's, there's also some financial aspects of the m &I as a company uh, and its benefits uh, in terms of funny accounting or fun with accounting uh, that show up. Uh, now you do see car ferry operations kind of do linger a little later on at Upper Mississippi. And I think part of it is, is the icing of the rivers makes ferry boat operations difficult. When you've got a river that freezes, uh, you wanna get, you wanna stop having to deal with ferry boats pretty quick. South of St. Louis, the ferry boat operations kind of linger. Uh, this is the Queen and Crescent uh, ferry boat uh, operating out of Vicksburg, Mississippi. This starts in the 1880s um, and survives even after uh, JP Morgan uh, consolidates uh, into the Southern Railway and lasts until 1820 or 1926. Uh, again, a bridge across the river is the fundamental reason why this goes away. Uh, the economics just don't pan out. Also, uh, you're starting to see some competition and pressures on the railroads. And if there's a marginal line of business in this era in the 1920s, uh, they're going to start looking at getting rid of it. Uh, New Orleans had a significant and long-standing ferry operation, uh, including the Sunset Limited crossing here uh, between New Orleans and uh, Avondale, Louisiana. Uh, and that lasts until the 19, uh, 1950s, actually. Uh, the Huey Long Bridge is what puts that out of, out of business. Uh, there were six railroad ferries in operation in the 1930s in Louisiana. Uh, which if you think about it, that's impressive, but also consider the difficulty of getting the Huey Long Bridge built uh, in Louisiana. Uh, the river is so busy down there, as Dave was pointing out, you know, it's just, you know, they can keep sending barges down. You've got ocean going traffic and to really put a crimp on the fluidity of the river traffic by building the uh, Huey Long Bridge, uh, you're going to get a lot of resistance uh, from shippers and uh municipal uh, entities saying, you know, you're, you, you want to do what to our, our, our bottom line here. Uh, but Huey Long does get that bridge built. Uh, and it, again, ends the railroad ferry operation in, in Louisiana. Uh, 
Wiggins, of course, was not the only uh, operation in, in the St. Louis area. Uh, this is a, a Father Keller talked about Wiggins and its competition, but further west of town, we did have the North Missouri Railroad, which is today Norfolk Southern. It became the Wabash. Uh, it had its own ferry operation uh, that connected uh, St. Louis to St. Charles. And then from St. Charles, it connected with the uh, Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad uh, until it built its own line to Kansas City after the Civil War. Uh, this operation started in 1864. Uh, it's a great little uh, pamphlet about uh, this came with the 1936 bridge getting constructed. Uh, but you see the various ferry boat operations on the Missouri here in St. Charles. And then 1871, the first bridge gets built and that's the end of the ferry boat. Uh, and then that bridge gets replaced by the current bridge that was a 1936 bridge. Uh, same thing happens in Cairo, Illinois. Uh, significant ferry boat operations for the Illinois Central and other companies in that area. Uh, when the IC builds its bridge across the Mississippi and or across the Ohio, that's pretty much the end of the ferry boat operation. Uh, what's driving all this bridge building? Well, one, the Civil War is over. Railroads are just expanding. They're moving beyond single region railroads uh, into multiple region railroads, uh, almost transcontinental. In fact, that becomes a big goal with a lot of the robber barons is to try and build or create or forge a trans, a true transcontinental railroad system, much like uh, what we see in Canada today with the Canadian National and Canadian Pacific systems. Um, it never works out uh, for whatever reason, but this coupled with improved technologies, uh, there's investment, there's engineering expertise, there's metallurgical improvements that make bridge building across these major navigable rivers uh, feasible. And the other thing to note is if you've ever been on, say, uh, the MacArthur Bridge on an Amtrak train or uh, the Susquehanna Bridge on an Amtrak Northeast Quarter train, any of the bridges in Chicago that uh, are there, uh, these bridges are large, heavy duty, and either very high up or they are mechanized in such a way to raise up and allow river traffic to pass underneath. Uh, Cleveland was famous for its, its uh, lift bridges or uh, draw bridges. Uh, Chicago, New York uh, has a couple, uh, but you know, they're tall bridges in New York for the most part. Uh, this is pretty much, you know, this wave of construction is, is the death knell of the traditional railroad ferry as we think of it on a river in the United States. Uh, in fact, in all of North America, as these bridges get built, you see the ferries start to go away. And they're only either kept in place because the company is, is, feels a need to keep it for a customer or some other economic reason. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they're gone by the 30s and 40s. Now, it doesn't mean that ferries in general do go away. They're, they become, they remain vitally important operations in harbors well into the 20th centuries. Uh, this is the uh, Southern Pacific Ferry in uh, San Francisco, uh, the uh, Solano. Uh, now these ferries aren't necessarily there because they are vital to a transportation link. They're vital to alleviating gridlock and congestion on the rails. Uh, Instead of having a ferry boat operation in the middle of nowhere crossing a significant river, what we have is ferry boat operations in congested harbor areas and urban terminals that alleviate congestion of rails. Excuse me one second. Okay, for those of you following at home, the library computer lab is now closed. Um, this operation uh, in San Francisco Bay lasted until 1958 with multiple railroads involved. There was a similar operation between Portland and Vancouver, Washington. Uh, uh, 
which lasted for the most part until the bridge uh, between those two cities was built, but um, also was a convenient safety valve until capacity was, was, had really developed. But these, these harbor operations, I mean, for the most part, everybody thinks of the big East Coast ports. Uh, this is Boston. Uh, we've got railroad boxcars on barges being brought directly to a steamship at a pier. Uh, there's no need to lay track on this pier. There's no need to worry about switching for this pier. You just bring the boxcars, the stevedores come on board and move brake bulk cargo directly onto the ship. And then of course, you've got the granddaddy of them all, New York Harbor, which uh, this is 1900 showing the, the New York freight railroads. This is actually, I pulled this off of Wikipedia. It was actually an excellent map for showing what we needed to see. Um, here's the High Line in Manhattan. If you've been to that park, there's Grand Central. There is no Penn Station yet because it's 1900. But look at all of the terminals here on the Hudson River in New Jersey and on Manhattan. And what this really doesn't show is the industrial uh, force that was on the island of Manhattan. You know, Manhattan did not lose its manufacturing until after the Second World War. Uh, that's something that, that younger people today who see New York don't really think about how much stuff was made on Manhattan. Um, and, and that stuff had to have raw materials and components brought in and finished goods moved out. And in most cases, it was on a boat for part of its travel to get to one of these terminals here in New Jersey. This is uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad's map of its New York operations um, after uh, Penn Station was built in 1917. So you've got the, the, the tunnels, you have the car ferry, which actually, honest to goodness, still exists and operates. And you had uh, connections to the Long Island Railroad in Brooklyn and uh, the Bay Ridge uh, area in Brooklyn. Staten Island had a, a railroad operation and an industrial operation. Uh, Queens had some fact and manufacturing. Uh, Jersey City was a significant manufacturing center. And, and all of this freight traffic, if it weren't for the barge operations, the existing uh, freight rail network just could not handle it. Um, shocker, shocker, the B&O Railroads, uh, 26th Street Freight Station in Manhattan uh, here. Uh, this is, this, and B&O is a minor player, but it's moving a barge between Manhattan and New Jersey multiple times a day, and they're switching this yard and moving goods in and out all the time. And think about the B&O, the Lehigh Valley, the New York Central, the Erie, the New York Susquehanna and Western, the Central of New Jersey. That's a lot of traffic being moved about in a harbor by freight, uh, by barge freight. Uh, then you've got stuff going into the Bronx. This is the Central Railroad of New Jersey going to the Bronx. Uh, and then you've got, in addition, the, the harbor lighter operations that are going directly to uh, steamships. Now, this is an improvement over the boxcar situation, where instead of committing a boxcar uh, to a barge that you've now lost use of that car uh, until it's unloaded and returned to service, you just unload all of this into a barge or a lighter, and a company tugboat will take that to the ship that it's supposed to go to, and it acts as a mobile transfer warehouse for you. Uh, they had specialized ones for liquids. They had specialized ones for uh, refrigerated goods. Uh, this was eventually how New York Harbor was handled really until containerization showed up uh, and, and took over uh, the eliminated break bulk uh, as an operation. Now, Everybody in New York had one of these. You've got three different railroads right here on their own. And it was not uh, just confined to New York. Every major port, east, west, uh, Gulf Coast, 
generally had some kind of lighter edge operation. And if you go to the various railroad historical societies, there are enough folks uh, who are interested in the rail marine aspect that you will find a plethora of, of individual articles. Um, also, the developments were covered in the trade publications because this was a, you know, one reason why the railroads were taken over in 1917 was how it, how uh, they had problems with uh, transferring goods from the railroads to the maritime customers to go across to Europe during World War I. There's a lot of outside factors involved, but anything that could have improved efficiency was going to get coverage. Now, I mentioned there is one operation in New York still standing. It was It is the New York, New Jersey Railroad. Uh, they, they still exist, and they basically run the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad's uh, route for their car fluid operation between New Jersey and Brooklyn. And, and they're still there. Uh, they connect with the New York and Atlantic. Uh, they are a class three terminal railroad. I don't think they've been bought up by uh, a, one of the holding companies yet, but um, they're still there. If you happen to check out uh, some of the, uh, the uh, various websites, uh, it's, it is a, a a magnet for rail fan photographers because it's the last one left. Uh, now, while the harbor uh, rail ferry operations and barge operations have flourished into the, the 20th century because of congestion in an urban area, there are other situations where congestion or the potential of congestion led to the adoption of a maritime interface with a freight railroad. Uh, one of them was uh, the uh, export of U.S. coal from New York State to Coburg in Ontario, Canada. Uh, this was a uh, you know, this lasted until 1951, and it was originally with the Buffalo, Rochester, and Pittsburgh Railroad, which itself was a a coal hauling and a timber railroad from its origins, and made a lot of money hauling coal. Uh, it connected at Rochester and uh, handed off to the uh, Ontario Car Ferry Company, which had the Car Ferry Ontario between Charlotte Dock, New York, and Coburg, Ontario. Uh, it was a very profitable and interesting operation for a period of time, and then it was it became very much less so. Uh, there's a there's a whole book about the company called Coal to Canada that if you're interested in getting the full story on. Uh, but a very interesting little little operation. Uh, you also had operations of a similar nature on Lake Erie. This is the Ashtab Ashtabula uh, that connected Ashtabula, Ohio with Port Burwell, Canada. Again, it was a coal operation. Uh, also, uh, it moved iron ore to Canadian steel mills uh, that were developing in Ontario and Quebec. So uh, they were looking for American metallurgical coal and uh, iron ore, and uh, they found a ready market uh, to justify the expense of, of building this ferry boat here to carry train cars, hopper cars full of those commodities to Canada. Now, as you go further west, you did have uh, an early ferry boat operation in Detroit with the Michigan Central. Uh, that doesn't last particularly long, thanks to instead of building a bridge, they decide we're going to build a tunnel underneath the Detroit River. Uh, Michigan Central buys that, builds that, and uh, that pretty much eliminates the need for uh, the, the car ferry operation. If you go on to shorpy.com, which is a historic photo website, you'll see a lot of pictures of this particular ferry boat in the winter. Uh, one convenient thing that sometimes these boats uh, would do, and you'll see it with the larger Lake Michigan ferry boats, uh, they had icebreaker bows or uh, were in, pressed into icebreaker operations to help other uh, boats with uh, Lake Commerce. And in fact, the Spartan and the Badger both uh, had that capability. Uh, Lake Michigan was another area where uh, it's such an enticing shortcut to connect uh, a very industrial state with Michigan. You know, you think about all the automobile uh, plants and the component plants that were built in Michigan that needed steel. Uh, I mean, historic imagery of River Rouge is a great example of what's going on there. Those raw materials, particularly iron ore, is on the other side of, of Wisconsin in Minnesota. 
uh, in the Mesabi range. If you can get that economically to Michigan, so much the better. Uh, Henry Ford opted to go with lake boats, but other companies, uh, you know, didn't have their own lake boat operations, and they went with rail transit. And companies like the Ann Arbor, the Paramarquette, uh, the Grand Trunk, uh, all had uh, ferry boat operations uh, that would take entire trains worth of freight across uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, we have, uh, fortunately, one example of these boats still running today. It is not a railroad ferry anymore, but the, uh, the Badger still runs, uh, Lord willing, uh, between uh, Ludington and Manawatuk uh, to this day. And uh, it's, it's now kind of a marketing as a passenger and uh, you know, take the experience, sa uh, save some time between the two points rather than driving all the way down the coast and all the way up the coast, uh, but it's there and, and it, it's still an example, an operating example of this. This ends in the 1960s and if Ray Lichty is, is on this uh, presentation, he, uh, he's written about his ex involvement with the uh, selling off of these car ferries uh, from the Pear Marquette, the Spartan and the Badger to their, their new owners uh, when the CNO BNO system decided it was time to to get out of the maritime business in Lake Michigan. We did have one last stab uh, at rail uh, ferry boat operations. Again, a shortcut idea from uh, the twin ports in Lake Superior to Thunder Bay in Canada. Uh, this is the Incan Superior and it ran between the twin ports of Duluth and Superior up to Thunder Bay. And it was designed to serve customers of the paper market. And uh, those boxcars you see, if you're a model railroader, you know those are the high cube boxcars that traditionally hold newsprint paper or rolls of paper. And that's what this, that's basically how it justified this, this boat's existence and its operations existence. It was a, a Canadian Pacific supported operation and it ran between 74 and 92 before finally the, the paper market really just didn't justify the expense anymore. Uh, but that really was the last gasp of, of true car ferry service on the Great Lakes. Uh, let's think about it, you know, almost 100 years uh, between the two, two nations. It was quite impressive. Uh, one city that tends to get overlooked in car fluid operations. Oh, here comes another announcement. Yeah. Okay, so I'm at the 15 minute mark and I got 10 slides left, so we're gonna be okay. Uh, Chicago is a city people don't think about with car ferry operations, but uh, the Erie uh, opted to go with that route because to be quite honest, they were the last guys to get in Chicago from the East and they had the worst routings. So to get to freight customers, uh, they could not build a new track in that area, either it was too expensive, the city wasn't gonna play ball or their comp competition had already taken the best spots and they opted to start a freight lighter operation in 1913, uh, which made it into railway age. That's actually where these images are from. This is a 1917 issue of railway age. Uh, there's the float bridge, there's the lighters, there's the, uh, tugboat with the car ferry, you know, they've got, they had a pretty interesting idea. Uh, now, granted, it did not succeed. They, they pulled the plug on it in 1936, but uh, it was the, you know, as, as, as the cowboy who jumped into the cactus said, it seemed to be the thing to do at the time. Uh, similar case for the Santa Fe in San Francisco. The Santa Fe was not a big player in the San Francisco market. That was pretty much dominated by the Southern Pacific, thanks to its longstanding presence dating back to the beginning of the Transcontinental Railroad as a, Southern, as a Central Pacific. Uh, Santa Fe used a car ferry operation in San Francisco Harbor, 
uh, to connect Port Richmond with other uh, freight terminals. And again, they were the last folks in. It wasn't necessarily the best uh, option they had, but it's what they had, that's what they could do. And it worked. It wasn't pretty. It didn't make a lot of money, but it made them competitive. Now, uh, I did say I was going to mention two, uh, two other uh, high seas operations. Uh, the first is uh, the Alaska Railroad. Uh, this is from Alaska Rails. It's a fan site on the Alaska Railroad. Um, there is a regular railroad car ferry and, as you can see, truck ferry service between the lower 48 and Alaska from Seattle to Whittier. Uh, that is the Whittier provider. It is a, a, a car ferry operation that is owned by uh, or operates with the, the Alaska Railroad. And it is regular service. That's how the Alaska Railroad gets its freight and that's how it moves freight between the US uh, lower 48 and Alaska. Uh, it is regular service. It still runs to this day. Uh, and until that uh, long talked about rail bridge in Canada that's gonna go up the Yukon gets built, uh, I expect that will be the only way to effectively transfer freight cars uh, between those two railroad systems. The second uh, maritime high seas operation is in the Caribbean and the Gulf. Uh, Florida East Coast used to run a, uh, a rail line to Cuba. And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Cuba was a significant source of American sugar. And in fact, Hershey uh, Chocolates had a significant operation there, uh, various fruit companies uh, and sugar concerns had, had significant operations there that generated a lot of freight. And Florida East Coast from uh, Port of Palm Beach, uh, ran regular car ferry service on a maritime ferry. And you can see it was built for, you know, real ocean going service uh, between 1915 and 1940. Uh, now West India Fruit uh, and Steamship is gonna take, or West India Steamship is gonna take over after 1940. And, you know, that traffic is gonna uh, kind of go away by 1961, uh, thanks to some uh, regime change in Cuba. But uh, that was a long-standing operation uh, there. There was also Sea Train, which went from New York and New Jersey to Cuba. And uh, rather than roll the cars onto and off of their ships, they lifted them. Uh, if you think about containerized freight these days, they were the pioneers. And in fact, they had tried uh, to get into that market early on before they went into bankruptcy uh, in 1981. Uh, again, they got crippled when the uh, Cuban market uh, went away, and uh, they tried Puerto Rico, and that didn't really work out. Uh, Mexico, there's a land connection, so it doesn't make much sense. Uh, so it just didn't, they weren't able to survive uh, with rail connections. But credit to them for a really cool idea. Uh, they started this in the 1930s, the idea of lifting uh, the cars on and off the ships. Uh, and there are some Berger images of this operation that unfortunately are really grainy that I opted not to put in, but I found that the Golier had some really nice shots to share. Now there is a Gulf of Mexico operation still in play today. And this is, this is really one of the last car ferry operations in existence. So you've got New York, Alaska, and uh, the CG Railway. This is the port of Mobile, Alabama. And they have two ferry, uh, two, uh, ferry boats that run uh, between uh, Mobile and Cotazacolo. I should have put a pronouncer in. Uh, Cotazacolo in Mexico. Uh, and that is a bottleneck break. Uh, operation. You know, they are looking at this as a way to get around the congestion of uh, the Rio Grande border uh, checkpoints uh, and the fact that Union Pacific, BNSF, KCS are pretty much have those operations running at capacity. So if you're CSX, Norfolk Southern, Canadian National, to a certain extent, Kansas City Southern, uh, and you want to kind of get around that 
and just drop the cars off in Mexico for immediate inspection at a port, uh, this is a good option. Uh, the downside is you can only move 115 cars at a time on these boats, but they're there. Uh, they, Gen Genesee and Wyoming thought that's a lucrative enough uh, operation to invest in. So uh, that's where they are, and they are operating to this day. Uh, they've been getting some pretty good coverage in the uh, uh, railroad magazines about it. Um, so we'll see what happens. Uh, interesting uh, to see if there's any talk about using that kind of idea to help alleviate the uh, intermodal bottlenecks uh, here uh, that we're experiencing today. If you uh, would like to learn more, uh, and I'm sorry I'm kind of rushing through, but literally it's 10 minutes before they close the building and kick me out. Uh, here's a brief bibliography, and I can uh, share this with anyone who wants it. Uh, if you're looking for a more specific topic, just let me know, and uh, you can email me directly, uh, and we'll have the contact information at the end of this on the video. Uh, and I'm happy to utilize the Berger collections. If we don't have it here, I probably know who's got it or where to find it uh, or who to talk to. But uh, thank you for your time. We've got about five minutes before they really start getting antsy about me being in here. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them. And Tom Keller, Father Keller gave me an update. The Badger is undergoing hull inspection. So that the Badger may be back in, into service very, very soon. Uh, the Spartan I know has is, is been out of service for a while. So um, its fate is unclear, but probably not good. So Badger's being repainted. Okay, great. Thank you, Bradley. So I'm happy to entertain questions that come up. Um, you can feel free to chat uh, or uh, you can uh, activate your microphone to, uh, to ask. There is another Lake Michigan car ferry at Manistee. Yes, there's a, there's a couple of them that have been preserved. Um, and uh, I'm glad to see that because it was a very interesting operation. And when you think about the amount of time it saved going through Chicago, uh, it was a really, really slick idea to, to you know, build those terminals and do that. Okay, well, again, thank you all for uh, giving us part of your Saturday to enjoy our presentations. And I'd like to thank again, Dave Jump and Father Tom Keller for their time in uh, delivering these really great presentations to us uh, for the library. Uh, this is probably gonna be the last one we do quarterly um, with the uh, improvement in access to the building on campus. Uh, we, we, we will probably be dialing this back in, in favor of more in-person events again, uh, which we like. And here comes the five-minute warning. The library warning. will close in five minutes. The library will close in five minutes. So uh, I look forward to seeing you at the library. If anyone does have reference questions, uh, feel free to let us know. And uh, if you do want to come by and use the collections, uh, we highly recommend contacting us ahead of time so we can make sure we've got everything you need uh, on site and nobody wastes a trip. But uh, thank you all again. And I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and a wonderful week. And you should expect to see links to YouTube for these videos within the next 24 to 48 hours. So thanks again. Have a good one.